Praise the Lord, you reach past the Priscilla Halling. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we love you, we honor you, we worship you, we adore you, we exalt you for being holy and righteous and pure and true and honorable and just. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because you are high and lifted up. You are our great habitation. You are our worship, our source of power. You are our provision, our wealth, our strength our protection, our knowledge, our understanding. You are our love, our joy, our peace. You are our comfort, our self-control, our long-suffering. We thank you because of who you are. We thank your heavenly father for being high and lifted up, holy and righteous and pure and true and honorable and just and praise word. We thank your heavenly father because the earth is the Lord and they that dwell within the fullness thereof. The world is yours. You created all things with a purpose and for your purpose we have been created. And so father, we submit to your created purpose. We submit to your honor. We submit to your glory. We submit to your purpose and your promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Worthy is the Lamb. Yes, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. Be the Yes. Thank you for the Thank you for the Wash me in your blessing, Lord. Now all I know, you're for me, blessed and embraced. Worthy is the name. We do not Oh, we pray, you Lord. You reign, you reign, you reign. Oh, yes, we do. 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 We love the Lord. We worship the Lord. We bow at the throne of grace. You are the Lord. So are the Lord. Holy, 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 the holy. Yes, Lord.
I glorify and worship your holy name. You're worthy, Lord, so worthy, Lord. Great is your habitation. Great is your habitation. Great is your habitation. Great is your habitation. We praise you, Lord, and worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Sometimes you just have to be reminded how worthy is the Lamb, high and lifted up. I didn't have a chance to go to church today, so I'm going to record this message. to stay steadfast in the works of the Lord. I had a wonderful weekend spending time that God has given me an opportunity to do. And whenever God gives us the opportunity to do such things, we ought to do it in the excellency of his glory and appreciate the time that he did. But one thing I've learned being a pastor while not using the title and sitting in an office where I normally would be or working from home and going to various venues over many, many, many years ago is that we can become so busy that we don't have time for our own personal enrichment, our own personal pleasures and enjoyment with God. And we have to take every opportunity that God has given us. Time to do so. Like Moses was given wisdom from his father-in-law. Who told him. You cannot take on this responsibility by yourself. Select able servants whom you can put in place that others can come to to handle responsibilities that you have given them authority to do on your behalf so that you would have time to continue to do the work of the Lord. Sometimes we can get too busy and don't have room for the Lord, don't have time for God, and miss out on some of the most important moments that God had in place for you to embrace. I learned that at a very young age in ministry. And while I will not go into a lot of detail, I watched a husband and wife that were both pastors. They could have both pastored their own churches separately. They've been pastoring well now for 45 years or more. And I would watch the, how they spent time with their kids, whom they have grandkids now, that are very well up in age. But back then, and I'm speaking about 35 to maybe 40 years ago, and I watched them for maybe 30 years and saw the consistency that no matter how large their church got, no matter how big and well-known they became, they never got too busy for their personal responsibility. And it always settled in my spirit a learning from the word of God that if we're faithful for what God has given us, our responsibilities, he'll make us faithful over more. Sometimes we can get into positions of ministry 
and we're too busy. Thinking that we have to be at a place for every moment to handle every opportunity and end up not taking care of what God has given you to take care of or to be available to. There are times when God will give us opportunity to enrich ourselves by other ventures. Um, there are times when God will give us opportunities to enrich ourselves with other people. There are times when God will give us opportunity to enrich ourselves with quiet times with him. But he determines, and each time it's an enrichment because God is developing, according to his word, the necessity of being obedient to God. He might want to enrich someone in the music. He might want to enrich someone in, in Sunday school or in finance or English or math or whatever they're doing. He takes the time to do that. And, 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 and sometimes we don't realize that. People could be building buildings and churches and office space and working on cars and establishing their own businesses and, and doing a multiplicity of things. And sometimes we can get too busy if we're not careful. But he also gives us time for pleasures. And the pleasures is that we are able to spend time enjoying ourselves with God. You can be very serious with the Lord and still enjoy yourself with God. There are times when people may be very busy on a job. And we've all been there. We got so busy, we didn't have time to take off and attend certain gatherings, whether it be personal or other settings. And we look back and time has passed by. We cannot become too busy when we don't have time to enjoy what God has given everyone individually and to enjoy what God has made of them. When you learn that, you understand like Moses, he didn't have to try to do it all. Jeffo said, it's not your responsibility to try to do it all. It's your responsibility to learn how to manage, to learn how to supervise, to learn how to select people that I've given you the knowledge and understanding and selection to do, to put them in place so that they would handle certain responsibilities. And while they're handling those responsibilities, you can handle additional responsibilities. And it's time for the people to understand that there are people that can be in place that are available. You don't have to come to most. Moses is one person. And if you don't allow Moses to have time for his personal family, for Moses was married, and he take care of his personal household, how can he be effective and assisting you, the external spiritual adopted man? that overflows into the kingdom of God. You see, God was establishing the order that was necessary. That was necessary. You could not change that. It was not mandated to be changed. Something that was necessary 
And I learned that in my 20s, how to balance, how to prioritize, how to be effective and manage my time wisely, but also my priority. That's so necessary. Because if you don't, you will find yourself looking back and regretting. So you ask God to choose, not because one is more important than another, but to choose at that moment what is necessary to do. It is necessary. We, we can be so enriched with God. And rich with God with his wealth. Wisdom is a defense and wealth is a defense. When the Bible speaks of that, he's talking about his riches and glory, where he gives us the, the fruit of the great wealth, where he gives us the execution of his talents and his gifts, skills and his learning ability. That's great wealth. Where he gives us the ability to, 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 to know something beyond just human understanding. That's great wealth. Because it will always make room. It will always reveal. It will always validate and demonstrate what God is doing. I didn't go to church today. And everybody should have a home church. And when we call it a home church, it's just a, a church that you consider your home church, a local church, a church that you are a part of. That even when you're away and you, you can't attend, you, 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 occasionally you do attend and, and you, you have a home church. Many people have home churches, but they don't attend all the time because they have other responsibilities. The ministry may take them away. They may travel a lot. It could be their job, their, their employment. We can't always control our time because some positions we're in, it requires a lot of responsibility. And I've had experience in all of that. There have been positions where I've had jobs and I almost work 24-7 on call. I could schedule something and something can happen and my company calls me in and I cannot make the commitment that I made. And it can become very difficult. And God just revealed to me. He says, always let them know if it's the Lord's will, then you shall. Because sometimes we make plans. We make many plans. But our plans may never be able to be fulfilled. Because we don't always know what can come about that will change our plans. And so I learned at a very early age in the 30s that I can take a calendar and put all my agendas on it, my plan, things that I want to accomplish. I want to be at this cabinet. I want to be at this service. I want to be at this. And have all the great intentions. You can put my name on your program. You can ask me to preach or teach a lesson. You can ask me to work in a special capacity. And I have all the right desire to do so. But something may come up when you, when you have to work outside that requires you to put that much commitment in that you cannot control. If you have to be there, you have to be there. God is not going to tell you to dishonor a contract and agreement you went into that he's providing through it for you to hinder and put at jeopardy for because of your will or others' will without asking him if it be his will and he allows you to coordinate and do it. 
We can't be at every place. So Jeffro learned at a very early stage that if he did not do that, it would not be profitable to anyone. And he learned that from his, what well, Jeffro learned by telling Moses. So Moses learned it from listening to his father. Sometimes you can get advice, wisdom from others that you know, but you fail to submit to. You know, but you somehow forget. You know, but you're not quite applying what you know. And that's very necessary that we always do that. Very, very necessary. Very, very necessary. I praise God for that and I thank God for his faithfulness. Because if you meditate on his word, if you meditate on his praise, if you meditate on his worship, it really does assist and handle in a lot of situations. A whole lot of situations. Some things you cannot change. You just can't. And when you can't, you have to trust God. You have to trust his faithfulness. You have to have joy that has nothing to do with the situation. Because the situation can be devastating but you have to know how to make the best of a situation. Moses had to learn how to make the best of a situation and trials and tribulations because everybody's not going to be pleased with you. Everybody's not going to like what God is having you to do. Everybody's not going to like what you do. Everybody's going to have an opinion. Everybody's going to have a direction. Everybody's going to have a will. Everybody's going to have a comment, a criticism, a desire. And you have to learn how to trust God to see you through it. The Father mercies and the God of all comforts. I don't know how people make certain things about certain things. I can't get into that. Everybody can take your messages and take them out of what it's about. You know, the adversary is busy. He can take what God meant for good and try to turn it around for his waiting witness, for his folly. But God will always bring back remembrance, the reality of the truthfulness of the spirit of the understanding of his wisdom through the mess. We must keep that in mind. And so let us go to the scripture because it's the scripture that makes us what we are. We're going to talk about the faithfulness of God. It's his spirit that resides within these earthly vessels as we engage with the scripture for understanding and clarification. That's what's necessary. The faithfulness of God refers to his unwavering trustworthiness, reliability, and consistency. In the Bible, God's faithfulness means that he always keeps his promises, fulfills his word, and remains true to his nature, regardless of circumstances or human values. This attribute assures, this attribute assures believers that they can trust God, even when things seem uncertain or challenging. Let's look at the key aspects of God's faithfulness. Unchanging character. God's faithfulness is rooted in his unchanging nature. He remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hebrews 13, 8. He's a covenant-keeping God. God is faithful to his promises, never breaking his covenant with his people, even when they stray. 
Psalms 89, 34. He has great compassion, mercy. God's faithfulness is often linked with his mercy. Showing his commitment to his people comes from his love and compassion. Lamentation 3, 22 to 23. Let's look at some biblical examples of God's faithfulness. God promised Abraham that he would make him the father of many nations. Abraham's family couldn't fulfill that promise. Abraham's family could not stop the promise. Abraham's family did not even know the promise. Despite, despite Abraham and Sarah's old age, God fulfilled this promise by giving them a son, Isaac. God did not give Abraham and Sarah, Ishmael. That wasn't the promise. The promise was Isaac. Sometimes we can create through our fleshly working a promise that God did not make. Because we lack the fruit of the spirit, patience. We don't want to wait on God. God has promised or place within your spirit that he's going to do something for you, your career, be something materialistic. It could be something spiritually. It could be anything. You just know that God has promised he would do it. And you're waiting for it. And it seems like it's taking too long. And you begin to do like Abraham and Aaron. Hey, Sarah, you look at your age. You look at how long you've been waiting. You look at your age and you look at the reality of life. And you can't see it coming to pass. And so you begin to feel hopeless. You begin to feel defeated, you begin to feel that God can't or he won't bring it to pass. And you begin to work it out on your own. I'm going to share this with you. And uh, I'm doing this to encourage someone because it's very necessary. And this would destroy the works of the adversary and make the adversary very mad. Because he doesn't like the spirit of truth. For many of you that might know this, I'm not in my home. And I haven't been in my home for many years. I don't know what happened or why I'm really not in my home. Because I certainly never bought anything I could not afford. Especially if I've been doing ministry for that many years and you know, the ministry didn't come with a paycheck. I was given more than I've ever received. And so everything I had, I no longer have. I felt like Job, literally. But I got angry. And the reason being was, It wasn't God's doing. God allowed it. He allowed the devices, but it wasn't his doing. And I should not have gotten angry and, and sin. You know, you can be angry, but not, not sin. I got angry, but I sinned. I sinned by being frustrated and wanting to retaliate and wanting to avenge and wanting to, to just destroy what was trying to destroy me, but I couldn't. God will never let you go so far when you really belong to him. He will never let you go so far when you want to be kept. It's almost like the priest that was able to go into the Holy of Holies. And if something would happen, there was a rope around him that it could pull him out because you couldn't go in, you weren't authorized. It's like the Holy Spirit has a rope around you. 
that he'll pull you back and you can't go so far because you belong to him. He convicts you. He instructs you. He reveals to you and lets you know that vengeance is mine. Don't worry. I was upset and, and angry because a car had ran into the side of my home. It was an accident, intentionally. Uh, my, my air condition was destroyed. You know, much was going on. Even my vehicle was being destroyed. Um, and, and I was just getting frustrated. And many more things. And I, I knew better. But I was getting frustrated. Getting frustrated because I knew God could stop. But that wasn't a frustration. The frustration was that it was planned. And when you know something is planned, it works on you different than when you're going through something and you're not sure. Because when you're not sure, you seek God. You pray and fast more. You're more attentive to wanting to hear from God because you're not sure. But when it's premeditated and almost uh, like an intimidation, the flesh gets angry. And, and, and I didn't handle it the way I could have. Um, but I didn't handle it the way I wanted to either. Because when you know that things are premeditated and, it, and it's not coincidental, it's done uh, purposefully out of mean spiritedness, you want to destroy. That's just a part of humanity. You want to stand up. And, and, and I said, no, let me handle it. Let me handle it. And so it took a while for me to just let God be God. It took a while for me to just push past it and still enjoy my life despite of it. Despite of it. Where it doesn't affect me. I don't have a deja vu moment. Uh, not tripping. It's in God's hand. And so sometimes you may go through something and you know it's not coincidental. You know it's purposely planned to irritate you, to hinder you, to try to demoralize you, demean you, to destroy you, to make mockery like they plan to destroy Jesus. But God gives us self-control and the self-control allows you to put it in God's hands and remember, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But when God told me, don't worry, I can give you all that back. I waited. And because it didn't happen like I thought it would, I began to try to work out things on my own. I began going to play the numbers. Now, I never played the numbers. And I was literally playing the numbers. And I found myself spending more in the numbers that I could have paid off much because I wasn't gaining anything. And God was teaching me and showing me, you're like Abraham and Sarah. You're trying to work something out. I made a promise to you. And you're trying to figure out how it's going to be done. So you're operating in the flesh and I'm trying to show you the spirit. We all do that sometimes. And sometimes we have to be honest to you to let you know, even at levels that I am, I'm not a novice. My faith is not novice. I know the power of God. I've experienced the power of God. I know the promise of God. I've experienced the promise of God. I know everything I've accomplished has come from God. And even though you know that, there are times when you go through things that you don't forget, but you push it in the back because you want flesh to work it out because you're lacking patience. But let patience have its perfect work 
so that you may be made complete and entire wanting nothing. So when you know things is planned, you begin to rebel. I'm not going to do this because this was not. When I, I would have always done that and not even let this bother me. But because this was pre-made, I'm not going to do it. That's how we are. That's the natural humanity's response. And God said, no, mm -mm. Just, just, just trust me. Just trust me. I'll work it out. I'll work it out. So I began to release it all in God's hands. And he began to change the thing. What angered me no longer angered me. What frustrated me no longer. What was being set up to make it about no longer became a concern. Before anything I did, it was made as if I was a part of something that I wasn't. And I couldn't understand how. I never agreed to it. I never said it, don't know where it came from, didn't put my signature on it, didn't sign off on it, didn't authorize it, didn't agree to it, but it was projected like I did. It was demonstrated and distributed like I signed off on it that I didn't. And so God had showed me. What matters most is what God knows. Don't worry about it. Go on with your life and let me work it out. So as I continue to move forth, it just all went away. It just all went away. And then I look at things and look at the price of it. Everything is three and four and five times more. that makes it almost unattainable that the adversary wanted me to see it and get frustrated and give up. God said, no, mm -mm. I'm your defense. I'm your wealth. I can place and do whatever I want. Don't you ever forget that. I told Abraham and Sarah what I would do. They went ahead of me and did their own thing. But I kept my faithfulness. I kept my promise. I'm a promise keeper. I'm a covenant keeper. I'm the one that does not change in character. I have compassion and mercy. Even when you go ahead of me trying to work something out. And so I thank the Lord for what he was doing. I was grateful because it took some time because it was expected for me to respond one way with those knowingly that it was done to get my attention to see what I would do. And so God was showing me, when you know something is being done purposely, you handle it differently when you don't. But when you know it's being done, you respond much differently. So I ask God, then teach me how to respond, even though I know it was done premeditated so that I can handle in the way that I've always handled things when I didn't know. So that I'm still operating, trusting you and not trying to respond in a way out of retaliation. Because you said vengeance is yours. And so he told me to think on this, and I'm going to say this, that maybe this will help somebody. 
Whatever God wants for my life, it shall be. He said, whatever I want for your life, it shall be. Whatever I wanted for Abraham and Sarah's life, it came to pass. No matter what happened, it came to pass. No matter what they did, I had compassion and mercy for them. They went ahead of me. But I fulfilled the promise that I gave them because I'm a covenant keeper. I'm faithful. I change not in my character. Whatever God has for your life, it shall be. It cannot be changed except it be changed by God. No principalities, no powers, no spiritual wickedness, no darkness in high places can stop what God has for your life. And so he reminded me. You have a greater expectation and that expectation is in me, Lord. The Lord. And I began to see things differently. I was free. I began to enjoy myself. Then problem, people had a problem with me enjoying myself. They didn't have a problem with me going through things. They had a problem with me enjoying myself. Because now the things I'm going through is not hindering. It's not changing my personality. It's not changing my faith in God. It's not changing the joy and the peace. Because the joy and the peace is not about what you're going through. But they couldn't understand it. And you have to be true to who God has created you to be when he's working through you, when you're going through something that he knows he's going to work it out for you. But oppositions may come up against you. You cannot live your life for others. You're not here to please others. You're here to please God. And how you journey through your trials and tribulations will be defined by the character of God who knows you who has set things in place to carry you through. Just, I just couldn't understand. I'm sure Abraham and Sarah learned if God doesn't sign off on it, it doesn't have his approval. God didn't sign off on what Abraham and Sarah did. He promised them Isaac. God isn't signing off on everything we do when we're going ahead of God. We have to wait for God for the fulfillment. And when he signs off on it, you'll know it. Because it would have the excellency of his power, the excellency of his knowledge, the excellency of his will, the excellency of his understanding, the excellency of his wisdom, and the excellency of his glory. It took me a while to receive what I knew, the understanding of what God was working on me to get me that way. I wanted to do it my way. And God said, no. That's what the adversary wants you to do. It's like being in the wilderness and they couldn't come out the wilderness because they were murmuring and complaining. They couldn't see the small provisions which would eventually illuminate to the great provisions. Faith over few things, faith over many things. That's not people. They couldn't be faithful over the small things God was giving. The provisions he was giving. 
They murmured and complained about the things that he was giving them, small things. So they could not be ready to receive the big thing, the promised land that he had provided for them. So he had to keep them in the wilderness to try to reveal to them the necessity of in everything, give thanks unto God for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. I had to learn how to thank God even for the trials and tribulations, not for them, but that he's with me in them. Not the trials and tribulations that he's with me in them. And that whatever he wants me to learn from them, and through them, he will carry me through and reveal to me a more excellent way in how to endure. See, we have to learn perseverance. We have to learn endurance. And it's difficult when you know that is being manifested by the wrong spirit. It irritates you. And when it irritates you, if you're not careful, you'll respond differently when you didn't know it. Because God teaches you the more you engage with him about some of the things you go through. So you just don't accept everything and God shows you how to handle some of the things that you would not handle the same way. And so then you begin to depend on God more. And as you depend on God more, some people get a little more irritated because they want to make it about something that you're not doing. Because somebody else may have had a good idea and thought you were. They may have had their personal agenda, their plan for whatever they're doing and want to include you in it. Like Hagar. It wasn't Hagar's idea that was Sarah and Abraham. But Hagar got pulled into their idea. And sometimes when God is fulfilling a promise in your life, the adversary will pull some people into your ideal to get you off of the wheel of the path that God is moving you so that you will stay faithful and committed, so that you will stay trustworthy and faithful to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think of according to the power that working within you. That's why Romans 5 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Who doesn't want you to stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God? And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Who don't want you to glory in tribulations? Also knowing that tribulation works with patience. Who don't want you to have patience? And patience experience. Who don't want you to have experience? And experience hope. Who don't want you to have hope? And hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Isn't that interesting? God was showing Sarah and Abraham after they pulled Hagar into their plan that was not God's will. So it wasn't the excellency of God that they received, it was works of the flesh. Works of the flesh will never be the excellency of the work of the spirit. And as I was getting frustrated, trying to work things out because I lost patience, almost lost hope. It, God just wasn't moving fast enough. He wasn't moving fast enough. And I was upset. And we can be angry, but we cannot sin. 
And I was sinning because I was angry. And not allowing my patience to carry me through the anger. And so God had to take anger and teach me how to stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Of his promise being fulfilled. Not the promise of others. Not the ways and acceptance of others. But the promise of God will be fulfilled for my life. That the truth be manifested. If God said it, that settles it. You can't change it. You can't rewrite it. You can't stop it. You're not the author nor finisher. God is. And he had to teach me how to, through tribulation, work patient. And how, through tribulation, my patient is working and it's building up my experience. Had a lot of experience in God, but not an experience like this. My experience in God was much different. But this was a different experience. And the greater the tribulation, the difference in the experience. And he has to show us how to work it through it. How to take that patience. And work it through the tribulation. To build upon experience. To remember past experience, how God worked it out. When you thought it couldn't be. And this time it seems more difficult. But there's nothing compared to God. Because the more it appears difficult in the natural, the greater the supernatural manifestation of the working of God's shall be. Which builds upon your hope. A greater expectancy in him. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And so God had to do that. And he reminded me about Abraham and Sarah. About how he fulfilled his promise. Everybody's promise is going to be different. There's going to be a different level of tribulation. Abraham and Sarah was getting old. They trying to work this out in the natural. What they know from humanity's knowledge. Sometimes we try to work things out in the natural. What we know from our knowledge. I'm looking at the economics. I'm looking at societal. I'm looking at how things are orchestrated and working now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at what should be, but it's not happening. And so I'm asking God, why? Why? And God said, I'm working this out. This is a tribulation. I'm working it out, but I'm giving you patience. I didn't tell you when, I just said I would. I didn't tell you how, I just said I would. And you're going to have to have patience. So that this patience will build upon your experience. See, experience is something that you have, something that you've done, something that you have knowledge of, something that you have went through before. So he's reminding me, what did I do for you before when you didn't think it could be done? I came through for you when you kept your mind stayed on me, when you stayed faithful, unmovable, always abounding in my will and my ways, despite what was coming up against you. But this time, you know, it was premeditated, so you moved, you shift, you tried to work it out. In the natural, 
but I'm building your experience, showing you greater spiritual warfare. You don't have to work this out. I got this. You can rejoice and stand in the hope of my glory. And many are not going to like you rejoicing because it's the rejoicing, the joy that's your strength. And they don't understand what strength is. Your joy in the Lord that keeps working it out. They can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The adversary don't want to see you rejoicing in the Lord. The adversary don't want to know that you're not worthy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You're moving past it. You're enjoying your life in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the adversary think they got something. The adversary think they're doing something. The adversary think they're stopping something. The adversary think they're controlling something. And I'm showing you the experience that I've given you. Don't forget Abraham and Sarah. They went before me. Don't go before me. Don't try to work this out. Wait on me. Have patience. If I made the promise, I'll keep it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Makes no difference where you're at. Makes no difference where to see. You're doing this unto me. And if I don't have a problem, don't worry about what nobody else has. That's your least concern. Because if you do, you'll be like Abraham and Sarah trying to work something out. You'll be pulled in the middle of trying to work something out. That God has already worked out. He just hasn't revealed. And that's the beauty of who God is. And so I got a lot of rejoicing and hope and, 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 and excitement and joy and peace and comfort, long suffering and gentleness and self-control. See, when your self-control goes, your patience is gone. That's a warning sign to everybody. Your patience is gone. That's a, a rod that God shows you. Your patience is being tried and tested. You got to bring it under subjection to the will of God. So that your hope won't be ashamed. Because your hope is not in humanity. It's in God. Because God made the promise, not humanity. And if God said it, he's going to do it. That's why the love of God is shared abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That gives you the inner strength to keep perseverance, to keep enduring, even though it appears that it will never come to pass. I don't care what the economy says, how prices keep going up, how things keep changing, how you getting older, and certain availability may not be a value. God says, remember the promise to Abraham and Sarah. With me, everything is possible. But with humanity, it's impossible. Oh, when God says, tell them, whatever God says shall be for my life shall be. 
that settles it. That changed everything. I saw life differently. I began to enjoy life differently. I begin to appreciate life different. Because God said, whatever he has for my life shall be. And I can't be concerned, but other stay or one. That's what's so necessary. You have to be careful. Because the adversary is cunning. That, you know, they thought bringing Hagar into the situation. They could work it out. But it didn't work out. It wasn't the promise. It just stirred up more strife and contention. And they had to learn from God. Let's get ready to bring this to closure. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 mm. Let's look at some other examples of God's faith. Joseph was sold into slavery, wrongfully imprisoned, and faced many hardships. God remained with him and elevated him to a position of power in Egypt, fulfilling his promise to protect and use Joseph for a greater purpose. Can you imagine Joseph in Egypt waiting on the promise, trying to work it out like Abraham and Sarah? Thinking he's getting older. Thinking he'll never get in that position. Thinking he'll never see the promise. Because he didn't know the promise was in Egypt. He thought it was with his family. And when his family moved him from where he was at and he ended up in Egypt, he thought the promise would never come to pass because he didn't fully understand the promise. Like Abraham and Sarah didn't understand the promise. They didn't know how it could be fulfilled. Joseph didn't know how it could be fulfilled. He didn't even know where. When God gives you a promise, he don't even tell you where. And sometimes people don't understand you don't know where. God didn't tell you. He just told you a promise. And you got to obey God because the Holy Spirit will keep you obeying him despite of humanity. This, the Bible says in Genesis 39, 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Here he is in prison, wonder how the promise going to be fulfilled. But the Holy Ghost, the mercy and favor of God was upon Joseph in prison. It protected Joseph for a greater promise. God will protect you for a greater promise while he's fulfilling his promise. He protects you. Joseph was away from his family. Protection. Because his family wanted him dead. They wanted to plot and scheme and get rid of him. They would have gave him a nervous breakdown. He would have stayed with them with all the things they were doing. God moved him. And he went through trials and tribulations with those he didn't even know. But God still showed mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So let's look at the Israelites. 
God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, led them through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Despite their frequent disobedience, God faithfully kept his covenant. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Can you imagine God is delivering you and it's not taking long enough, but he's keeping his covenant. He said he'd take you to the promised land, but you can't see the promised land and the provision he's given you, you're complaining about. You're murmuring about what you see. And you've forgotten the hope of a greater expectation of where he's taking you. If you can't handle what he's showing you now, you'll never be able to handle where he's taking you to. If you can't handle being humble and obedient now, you'll never be humble and obedient then. Let's look at David. God promised David his throne. He said it'll be established forever. Even when David sinned, God was faithful to his covenant. Untimely fulfilling this promise through Jesus Christ, the descendant of David. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God will not break his covenant nor not uphold his word that comes forth from his mouth. He told David, your throne is going to be established forever. God's mercy and compassion was over David when he disobeyed. God kept his covenant. His covenant being kept was not about David. It was about God. And David knew God, but he made some bad choices. And God, mercy and grace extended to what David kept this cup. Because it was being fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The one with no sin. The one that cannot be corrupted. The eternal, immortal, invisible, only wise God of creation. That is able. To keep you. Let's look at Daniel. God protected Daniel in the lion's den, showing his faithfulness to those who stand firm in the faith. Now that's 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 that's, that's wonderful to even think about that. Those who stand firm in the faith, because we see the correlation in Romans 5, where it says, We stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Daniel 6, 22, my God have sent his angel and have shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me. Sometimes things will try to hurt you. People will try to hurt you. But God can shut their mouth so they cannot hurt you. If you stand strong in the faith. Stand strong in the faith. Don't change your God. Stand strong in the faith. Don't try to work it out. Stand firm in faith. Don't lean to your own understanding. Stand strong in the faith. Because God's covenant is faithful and trustworthy. And God's character is unchangeable. And what humanity cannot do, God can. Just because people have their plans, and come at you in every way. You better trust God.
Because the adversary is busy. You better trust that God is going to fulfill his covenant. No matter what people say, no matter what people do, no matter what people want, no matter what people think, no matter what people try to divide, God's covenant is going to be fulfilled. Stand firm in the faith and rejoice in the God of your hope. First Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that called you, who also would do it. Stand firm in the faith. No matter what you see or don't see, stand firm in the faith. Because if God said it, it's going to come to pass. You see, the faithfulness of God provides a firm foundation for trust. Because God is faithful, believers are encouraged to remain steadfast in their faith, knowing that God will provide his promises and protection. Stand strong in faith. God didn't tell Abraham he needed to get another person to have the promise fulfilled. He said, God, Abraham told God, I'll do it for you. Abraham didn't tell Daniel he needed another promise to have the faithfulness of God. He told Daniel, I'm going to shut their mouths. Abraham didn't tell David he needed another person to get the promise of God. He told David, I'm going to fulfill my covenant through Christ Jesus coming from the lineage that will be established forever. Abraham didn't tell, God didn't tell the Israelites they needed another person to get to the promised land. He said, I'll give you the promised land. Abraham didn't tell Sarah. God didn't tell Sarah and Abraham to put another person. He said, I'll fulfill this. And God didn't tell Joseph he needed another person. He said, I'll keep you through my mercy and grace and favor and fulfill my covenant. What we have to remember is that the covenant comes from God. Makes no difference what somebody thinks. Makes no difference what somebody wants. You better let God's covenant be fulfilled in your life. Stand firm in the faith. And let God work it out. It was the coat of many colors that put Joseph in a pit to be killed. It was colors that started the problem. He had a coat of many colors and a vision. And the jealousy was over the coat of many colors with the vision. And God didn't tell Joseph a color. He said, stand firm in the faith. I'll give you favor in my sight with mercy and grace. It is God that upholds all things by the power of his word. He didn't tell Abraham he needed to see anybody. He didn't tell Daniel. He didn't tell David. He didn't tell Joseph. He didn't tell the Israelites. He said, look unto me, the author and finisher of your faith. Stand strong in me. And I'll do this.
a light affliction. When I was going through it, I was devastated. But now I see it as a light affliction. Because God is going to fulfill his promise, no matter what. When I didn't understand it, I was devastated. Couldn't believe God would allow it. A righteous God that would allow unrighteousness. But God never allows unrighteousness to continue to prevail. He said, I'll fulfill my covenant. When I was being criticized and mocked, I asked God, why? I'm not authorizing and signing off. Don't know where that's coming from. I didn't agree to that. Don't know nothing about it. God said, whatever the will is for you, I'll bring it to pass. Whatever God has ordained, whatever God's will is for my life, he said, I'll bring it to pass. Remember that. Stand firm in your faith. I'm omnipresent. Stand firm in your faith. I can do it wherever I want to. However I want to. Wherever I want to. I'm God. Stand firm in your faith. What's impossible with humanity can only be made possible with God. What was impossible for Daniel? God shut the lion's mouth. What was impossible with David? God would not allow his covenant to be broken with David. Noah's altar to change the things that went forth from the mouth of God. What was impossible with the Israelites, God's love and mercy and covenant kept them and commanded them and took them to the promised land. What was impossible with Joseph, God showed him favor and mercy in the sight of the keeper. What was impossible? With Abraham and Sarah, God brought it to pass. Stand firm in the faith. Stand strong in the faith. Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because trials and tribulations will come. And some things we can't control. But God came. And even when we don't understand it, we got to trust the heart of God beyond it. And sooner than later, you'll see it was just a light affliction. Just a light affliction. He'll never give you more than you can bear. Never give you more than you can bear. Never give you more than you can bear. 
the greater the tribulation. The greater the hope of his expectation. This message encouraged me in the Lord. It encouraged me in the Lord. Everything was being destroyed. Everything was being destroyed. But God kept me in the midst of it all. He kept me in the midst of it all. I was trying to work it out. Trying to use my, my mind. Carnality mind. Cardinal experience. But God had to take me in the spirit to work it out. To remind me this is spiritual experience. You've never been through this before. This was orchestrated on a higher level of premeditated. And God said, found guilty. And he began to work it out. My intercessor, my advocate. <laughs> my Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He viewed the evidence. He revealed the truth. He upheld everything by the power of his word. He made the stone of grace a greater habitation. And he taught me through his Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How to stand and rejoice in the hope of his glory. So that I can glory in tribulations. And let tribulation work patient. And patient experience and experience hope. That God shall bring to pass. Because the hope is in him and him alone. It, it amazes me. And God touches you, reveals to you, because all you did was ask. Anything that you ask in my name, I hear you. According to my will, I just ask God, God, tell me. Tell me, God, I need you. I need your help, God. I need your assistance, God. I need your wisdom, God. I need your understanding, God. I need you, God, to work this out through me. And God began to reveal it. He began to orchestrate it. He began to make it known. He can tell me mm -hmm. I'm omnipresent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It can't be stopped. It wasn't predicated on where you at. It was predicated on where I'm taking that. 
It wasn't predicated on humanity's desire. It was predicated on my will. It wasn't predicated on nothing humanity can do. This is predicated on my spirit. What I want, what I'm doing, and your life. That eyes have not even seen and ears have not even heard. What's in store when God works it out? See, God is good. God is great. And God is worthy to be praised. And nobody can change anything that God is doing. And just because God doesn't move mightily, humanity thinks that God isn't moving. That's what patience is about. Abraham and Sarah didn't think God was moving. Joseph didn't think God was moving. The Israelite didn't think God was moving fast enough. David didn't think God. Daniel didn't think God. But God was faithful. For he is faithful. He that had called at you will also do it. And the opposite word is God will do it. God will do it. And we forget who's going to do it. God will do it. God will do it. He can take any situation and work it out. If you let him. If you let him. If you let him. God will do it. God will do it. God will do it. He'll show you how to rejoice. And stand strong in the faith. He didn't say at a place. He said in the faith. See, some of us are trying to figure God out, work it out, and not trust him. He said in the faith. In the faith. This is a word of encouragement to those who may have just wanted to give up. May have listened to humanity. But didn't hear from God. God upholds what he says. And so many learned. There's a different joy, a different peace, a different expectation, a different experience, a different patience, a different self-control. When God begins to reveal and let you know. Whatever God's will, it shall come to pass. Whatever God's will, it shall come to pass. We just have to trust God. I 
I began to understand how some of the biblical character felt. Joseph. Misunderstood. On both sides. Hurt on both sides. Betrayed on both sides. Wrongfully. Treated on both sides. because he was just trying to obey God. That's all. But God found faith for that Joseph to endure. God is able. He truly is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think of according to the power that worketh within. There are many devices in humanity, but the counsel of the Lord shall stand forever. That's what God meant when he says, whatever his will, it shall be. Whatever his will, it shall be. And sometimes we overlook his will and try to have our very own will because we take the advice and wisdom of others over God. And it's only when we fully trust and relinquish our will, our desire, into the hands of God, that he makes it all. Comforting. And knowing his counsel shall stand His counsel shall stand forever. Why would anybody have a problem with me singing unto the Lord? Obeying God, singing unto God. Just singing unto God. Just singing unto God. No matter where I'm at. Just sing unto God. Rejoicing and praising him for who he is. Because he's been faithful. He's been my habitation. He's been my strong tower, my rod and my stay. He's been my hiding place. He's been my shield, my covering, my covenant. He's been my peace, my comfort, my provision, my protection, my strength. My wisdom, my knowledge, my understanding. He's been my defense. And God told me. What you do unto me. Is between you and I. And that settles.
God is a great God of wisdom and understanding. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being faithful, pure and true and holy and righteous and just. Thank you, oh Heavenly Father, that you worked it out. Because you knew all things. And most importantly, no weapon form could ever prosper. When we trust in you, thank you, Father, for showing yourself who you are, one that's incorruptible, undefiled, that changes not in character, that's full of wisdom from above. Knowledge and understanding. The Holy Spirit. That is higher than any principalities and any powers. Far wiser than humanity. From the very beginning of existence. more powerful and supernatural ability that cannot fail in its working. And so, Father, we thank you and we honor you for the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, the comforter that you gave, the Father of mercy and the God of all comforts that strength when feeling weary doing well-doing, when feeling anxious, when patient has not had his perfect work. Hmm. Mm, 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 mm. Father, we thank you. Amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God, God is just so great. He just, just has a way of confirming and doing what no one else can explain. We cannot lose self-confidence, self-control, nor faith during trials and tribulations that many may never know you face, that many may not even know you're going through because you're rejoicing in the Lord and standing strong with his fear. It is truly the joy of the Lord that gives you the inner strength. And the adversary can't destroy nor take your joy. The adversary can't take your joy. The adversary can't take your joy. The adversary cannot change the course of God's will for your life, right?
That's why it's a blessing to trust God. The blessing is trusting God. That's the blessing, trusting God. Because he changes not in care. He changed not in care. And we don't even have to question why he allows some things. All we have to do is trust God and not listen to humanity over God. And you'll be able to stand strong in the faith. And he will always be your wealth and your defense. That shall never end. Because he's eternal. You just have to understand what his wealth and defense is. The same way he'll be your rod and your stay. Your habitation. He is excellent in all his way. Amen, amen, amen.